Good afternoon. I am Ken Wallach, Chairman of the Board of the National Endowment for Democracy. Welcome to this brief but important discussion on rebuilding democratic momentum on the eve of the Summit for Democracy. When the endowment was established by the US Congress 38 years ago, one of its unique characteristics and assets was its organizational framework and mission, which reflected many of our own democratic institutions. Institutions representing Democrats, Republicans, labor and business united in the common cause of democracy. The four core institutes as they have been called have established and developed deep and abiding relationships with their international counterparts. The International Republican Institute, the National Democratic Institute, the Solidarity Center and the Center for International Private Enterprise represent in effect American chapters of an international club of democratic institutions, leaders and activists who draw strength and learn from one another. The net speaks of itself as a family disparate groups who share a common vision. And we are fortunate to have that family represented today by the leaders of the four or institute. Since 2001, Secretary Madeleine Albright has chaired the National Democratic Institute. She is a scholar, professor, best-selling author, businesswoman, and diplomat who held two of the country's highest diplomatic posts. I would add that she also prides herself as once being a Capitol Hill and White House staffer. Since childhood, when her family twice escaped Czechoslovakia, her country of birth, democracy and freedom have been personal to her. Her doctoral dissertation and subsequent research examined democratic openings in Central and Eastern Europe, and her public and private lives have given concrete expression to her commitment to a more democratic world. In full disclosure, the secretary was my chairman for 18 years when I served as president of NDI. Dan Sullivan, the junior Senator from Alaska is the chairman of the International Republican Institute. He succeeds IRI's longtime chairman, John McCain. The Senator has served in the US Marine Corps since 1993, both in active duty and in the reserves and has served in both the Department of State as an assistant secretary and in the White House. He was Attorney General of Alaska before entering the Senate, where he sits on the Armed Services Committee. He is deeply committed to bipartisanship in U.S. efforts to advance and sustain democracy and freedom globally, and works closely with Secretary Albright to send that message both at home and abroad. The Senator and the Secretary share links to both the Department of State and Georgetown University, where the Senator received his law degree and the secretary teaches her popular course on diplomacy. From Poland and Tunisia to Zambia and South Africa, democratic movements have been led by trade unionists who benefited from the support they received from their American counterparts. Liz Schuler, the first woman to become president of the AFL-CIO, chairs Labor Solidarity Center. Ms. Schuler's meteoric rise in the labor movement began as a union organizer for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, the IBEW. She was undoubtedly influenced by her parents. Her father, a union, uh, a union uh, uh, lineman, electrical lineman for Portland General Electric, and her mother worked among PGE clerical workers who were not unionized. It was only fitting therefore that Liz's first union effort fresh out of college was to organize clerical workers at the company where her parents worked. She eventually became the highest ranking woman in the IBEW. The Center for International Private Enterprise was founded on the principle that economic and political freedom are inexorably linked. Greg Lebedev serves as chairman of SITE, whose mission is to support free market institutions and economic reform. Mr. Lebedev is also a member of the Board of Directors of the U.S. Chamber of Congress. Commerce. He has served in senior government positions in three administrations, at the United Nations, at the Departments of State and Defense, and at the White House. During his work at the Chamber, he was its Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President for International Policy. 
He is widely known and respected for his expertise in corporate government. Thank you all for being here. Madam Secretary, can I begin with you? When it comes to global democracy trends, you have described yourself as an optimist who worries a lot. Your 2018 book, Fascism, A Warning, undoubtedly was an expression of those worries. Yet your recent article in Foreign Affairs Magazine predicted a democratic revival, certainly reflecting your optimism. Can you explain your more upbeat assessment and what do you see that would give us all greater hope? Well, first of all, Ken, I'm delighted to be a part of this discussion, not only with you, but with uh, my good friend, Senator Sullivan and Liz Schuler and Greg Lebedev, and to really uh, talk about how terrific an organization this is. And now with Damon Wilson there, I think uh, there are all kinds of possibilities and uh, looking forward to our further work. Well, let me tell you how I came to all this, because first, the sense of complacency among those who care most about democracy has disappeared. And with it, what I would really call the unrealistic euphoria that took hold when the Berlin Wall fell and alarms about freedom's future are spreading far and wide. So a challenge cannot be met until it's recognized and small D Democrats are well aware that we are in for a hell of a fight, to just to put it very clearly. And then, then my theory uh, that I wrote about is that second, it's easier to move upward uh, from a valley than from a peak. So despite our current distress, the globe is still far freer now than it was during the first five decades uh, of, of my life. We Democrats have an enlarged platform from, from which to mount a revival. And third, I think it is right to say that the rise in authoritarianism over the past two decades has taken place against the background of uh, international terrorism. The 2008 global financial meltdown, the Syrian civil war, a global refugee crisis, uh, a worldwide public health catastrophe. And these events stoked popular fears and frustrations and even panicked with uh, blame settling largely on elected leaders. So the next 20 years can hardly be uh, less conducive to democratic growth than the last, which is kind of a weird way to be optimistic at the moment. But anyway, the fourth, I think, and this is important to point out, that I really do think China and Russia have squandered their best opportunity that they might have ever had to offer a convincing alternative uh, to liberal democracy. Uh, between 2017 and 2020, the United States was missing in action and Europe was preoccupied with Brexit and, and other kind of uh, intramural uh, disputes. And the stage was set for Beijing and Moscow to present themselves as global models. And I would just say they failed. Uh, fifth, some of the forces that have fueled the rise of demagogues are undermining the staying power of authoritarian regimes, uh, now old enough to embody, believe it or not, the status quo. And there's a limit for how long an autocrat can sustain popularity simply by comparing himself now to a despised predecessor. So I think that um, they're really, uh, you know, in Russia, for instance, Putin is rarely contrasted anymore with poor Boris Yeltsin. In Venezuela, a few really remember the ineffectual civilians who governed before Chavez. Uh, Nicaragua's Ortega can hardly justify his broken promises by pointing to Somoza and Orban and Erdogan uh, have both been in power too long to escape responsibility for the sad state of, of their country. So finally, I really do think, and it's important, especially now to make this clear, we have a US president that is prepared to engage on democracy's behalf as is evident uh, by the Summit for Democracy. So that is why 
I am basically an optimist, but I do worry that we might miss some of the signals. Ken's on mute. I'm sorry, I just unmuted myself. Um, just a quick follow-up, uh, Madam Secretary. With our own democratic challenges, how do you respond to critics at home and autocrats abroad who might claim that the US has no influence or standing or credibility to advance democracy globally? Well, um, I believe that we do have credibility. We are the world's oldest democracy, but we're also dealing with the issues. We're having a discussion. Uh, and I think we are approaching this with humility, understanding that things have not gone the way that we would have liked in the last couple of years, that we need to really think about how to go about this. Nothing's gonna happen easily. Uh, and I know, Ken, we talked about this, that we've been various times when we were in Egypt, for instance, that an Egyptian member of parliament came up to me and said, uh, after I had suggested that they try compromise and coalition building. And he said, you mean like you guys? So we're not always the best example, but I do think that now if we put our mind to it and pick up some of the thoughts that I had in my earlier remarks, I hope that that will be kind of a, a way of uh, really uh, pushing us into thinking about what democracy is about and that democracy is not a spectator sport. Um, I don't know if you can see the pin I have on today, but it says, we the people. Uh, and that is what this country is about. And we the people need to really have our voices heard. Thank you. Senator, uh, what do you see as the role of the US Congress, the government at large, and groups like IRI and NDI in contributing to positive change globally? And does the behavior of malign actors led by China and Russia pose a real and present danger to democratic progress globally? And how do we and our democratic allies respond? Well, Ken, thank you for the question. And, and I wanna just begin by thanking everybody on the panel. It's great to be here with the, the Ned family and all the different counterparts and Madam Secretary. Always good to see you, um, and it's great to be with you again. And, and Liz, I, I, I just wanted to mention very quickly, we have something in common. My, my great-grandfather was one of the co-founders of the IBEW, of the whole union. I'm sure if you look at your history books, you'll see Frank J. Sullivan in there very prominently. Um, so we, we have a lot to talk about in that regard as well. But wow. um, Ken, look, I, I think uh, what, Secretary Albright just mentioned are the areas in which I think it makes a lot of sense to focus. But to be realistic, there's no doubt that democracy has been in retreat for a whole number of reasons. But we know where most of the challenges emanate from, as your question that you posed uh, indicates, and that's Russia. And that's in particular, in my view, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, led by Xi Jinping. So the good news is, I think that more than ever, there is bipartisan support in the Congress for the Ned family and what we're doing. There's bipartisan support for initiatives like what President Biden is doing right now with the summit of democracies, which I commend him and his whole team for doing. And there's bipartisan support to uh, really recognize that the 21st century, the biggest 21st century challenge that um, our country faces is the rise of the Chinese Communist Party. And we've been here before. Uh, you know, we know as a country. Uh, how to put together long-term strategies. If you look at the strategy of containment after World War II as the Soviet Union challenge presented itself, 
And I would say that the Chinese Communist Party's greatest fear is a long-term sustainable bipartisan strategy addressing the challenges they pose. That is happening. That is happening. I can say that with 100% confidence, certainly in the United States Senate, among Democrats and Republicans. Let me just mention one other area that I think is an opportunity, as Secretary Albright mentioned. These countries, we know one of their biggest um, vulnerabilities is they fear their own people. They fear their own people. Putin and Xi Jinping wake up every day nervous about what's happening in their own country with their own people. That is a vulnerability that we certainly don't have. It, it causes them, you may have seen, uh, in response to the summit that the president is putting on, China put out its own paper on democracy, claiming that they're a democracy. 51 pages, no offense, of a bunch of malarkey here on the great democracy in China. Why does that matter? Because they feel that they have to go to their people and say, well, well we, we are a democracy. Well, they're not, of course, they're a dictatorship. So these are the kind of vulnerabilities that both Democrats and Republicans are working on together. And I think uh, to the secretary's point, at least my time in the Senate, which is just a little under seven years, the change has happened in the last six years to focus on this issue together uh, as Americans has been really uh, startling, impressive and important. And I think we're on, we're on our way to establishing a long-term sustainable bipartisan strategy to deal with these challenges. And that's what our nation needs. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Ms. Schuler, Mr. Lebedev, um, the roles of labor and business in this mission are sometimes overlooked, but certainly not by the NED. What are your respective roles in defending democracy and helping to make de democracy deliver? And how can both institutes working with your friends internationally work to advance anti-corruption efforts that will certainly be a centerpiece at tomorrow's Summit for Democracy? Uh, Liz, first. Great, um, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, and I am so thrilled to join my fellow panelists uh, and the NED family today for this critical discussion. And I just have to thank the NED because um, the incredible work that the NED's done over so many years, um, standing up for human rights and democracy around the world, uh, the mission is more important now than ever. Working people de depend on you, so, so thank you. Um, for context, the AFL-CIO is America's labor unions. We are a federation of 57 different unions, 12 and a half million working people in every industry and in every sector of the economy, in every state, um, from Senator Sullivan's great state of Alaska uh, to Florida and everywhere in between. Um, and then through our work at the Solidarity Center uh, and the AFL-CIO, we know that stable democracies depend on what we call a basic social contract. And that's that people share in the progress and have a voice in shaping their democracies. Um, we know now the world is three times richer than it was just 20 years ago, but hundreds of millions of working families have been left out of those gains. Um, for example, 70% do not have access to social protection. 84% uh, of people surveyed around the world say that the minimum wage that they live, in, they live off of is not enough to make ends meet. And in 2020, COVID-19 was devastating, as we know, economically, and working people lost the equivalent of 255 million jobs. Think about that. So unions can be a solution to these economic disparities and unions are what we say is the most powerful vehicle for change, the, you know, to change the rules that have left so many working people poorer, less secure, more disenfranchised. 
Um, and unions are a powerful force for democracy because um, freedom of association, uh, a worker's right to organize and strike, these are fundamental to a democratic society and it gives people um, a mechanism to fight back against authoritarianism. So we all know that a healthy democracy uh, depends on democracy at the ballot box and in the workplace. And it relies on laws and rules that guarantee economic opportunity, equity, and inclusion. And economic equity and inclusion depend on freedom of association in the labor movement. And so that's why in the United States, we need to pass the PRO Act of Protecting the Right to Organize Act and the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act. Um, and it, at this very moment in many places around the world, um, people are disenfranchised and autocracy is winning. But civil society, the labor movement in particular, was born for this moment. And we exist to defend human dignity and expand human rights in the face of oppression and inequality. So look, we know in the history of progress, no government ever woke up one moment and you know magically expanded human rights. We know that. All our gains come from the collective action of people. Uh, people coming together to demand change. And just a few quick examples of the labor movement on the forefront of so many of the world's democratic movements. Of course, the independent labor movement that helped bring about democracy in Poland. We all remember that. Uh, auto workers organizing in Brazil sparked a movement and helped end authoritarian rule and usher in democracy. And unions were an essential part of the brave South African people's fight to end apartheid. And for the role they played in leading the revolution in Tunisia during the Arab Spring, the labor movement there was honored with the Nobel Peace Prize, okay? So the legitimacy of governments comes from the people. And the role of the labor movement is to demand democracy that delivers for working people and for everyone. And through workplace democracy, that gives workers a voice on the job and then brings the opportunity for collective bargaining that raises wages. And then the power of collective advocacy in the streets, in the halls of parliaments uh, around the world, you know, this is the goal. Um, that makes democracy real, and it delivers for real people in their communities. Thank you, Liz. Um, Greg? Thank you, Ken, and I too am delighted to be here, and, and I, should, I should add, as we said at the top, I think all of us are thrilled that Damon is, is leading the NED and its initiatives, and uh, we think that's such a positive sign for, for the hard tasks that we have all going forward. We talk a lot about democracy uh, and defending democracy when we in fact should be focused upon advancing democracy or, or more specifically advocating for the free enterprise system anywhere in the world because it's inextricably linked to democratic governance. I, I'm afraid to say that when we talk about democracy, we can get a little lazy. Uh, our habit is to discuss it in a philosophic fashion uh, as a lofty concept with uh, aspirational attributes. However, we should take the harder path, the path that the Ned family takes and begin to appreciate and implement the less elegant but more important ingredients of democracy, the stuff it takes to make the concept a reality. And it's that understanding that leads us, SIP and the business community to acknowledge that for democracy to exist and flourish, we must accept that we live in a new era in which democracy is not just led by governments, which can be ham-handed or heavy-handed. But to be successful today, democracy must be built upon inclusive and innovative discourse and advocated and embraced throughout a society. And any conversation about how a city or a province or a country should operate must be enlarged beyond public officials to include the most practical and effective voices within a society. And that's usually the private sector and its stakeholders. More simply said, democracy is a function of the relationship between business and government. Uh, we're conjoined. 
we need each other, uh, even though we hate to admit it. Uh, a robust free market economy lubricates a society and permits democracy to exist as no other condition can. As we regularly witness, frail countries with fragile economies are places where democracy is in decline and too few governments recognize that to cure its economic ills and begin to repair its democratic institutions, it must enable and encourage the only engine it has, private enterprise. These are the uncomfortable lessons. On too many occasions, it's a government's tendency to act without expertise, to fail to appreciate that free market capitalism is the answer to its economic woes, not the culprit. But for business and labor to do its job for any society, there must exist those old fashioned ingredients of democracy, the rule of law, accountable public governance, citizen engagement, political participation, gender equity, and a common concern for ethical conduct and environmental stewardship. In other words, an environment conducive to business success. So it's an inescapable truth that business and government must be partners, not adversaries, if democracy is to survive. Each must recognize and enable their respective roles. The government's job is to create a, a, an, an, an ecosystem for enterprise, which strikes a balance between necessary regulations and the freedom to operate and establishes the framework within which the private sector and the free enterprise system can do those things which only it can create opportunities for meaningful labor, compete ethically, provide sustainable uh, services, generate revenue and be both innovative and charitable. In short, serve as the economic platform for democratic governance. The lesson that must be learned over and over is that, is that a healthy free market economy is the fiber that holds democratic societies together. And it's the private sector, big and small, that helps guarantee that the hard work of, demo of democracy delivers for all the citizens. That's why we're here today. And I too applaud the president for his emphasis on global democracy. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, we're, we're gathered here on the eve of um, a summit at which more than 100 countries are participating. Can I ask each of you in your concluding remarks what you hope can come from this gathering, and not just from the meeting itself, but from the year of action called for in 2022. Uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, yes, thank you. It's very interesting having looked at the program uh, and what they have planned for the next few days. What they have done is put together, I think, the group of stakeholders in democracy. So obviously the political parties and the leaders, but also the private sector, the public sector, the, uh, the role of labor, uh, various parts of how our countries uh, operate internally and motivate uh, that kind of openness so that there is a discussion among the various stakeholders. Uh, it is not, there are speeches and things being given and will be, uh, there also obviously are ways that uh, people can have smaller, uh, either virtually or in person discussions. But I was really struck by the fact of these, uh, of describing the, the various parts of the program as stakeholders, uh, because I think that that is something uh, that is important to recognize how many parts of our systems uh, require participation by, uh, by others. Uh, for democracy to deliver, the various parts have to do their share. And so I think it also shows that President Biden has understood uh, the importance of democracy uh, having to be a leader uh, and a, uh, an important part of what is going on in the world, that there's this summit uh, and then there will be follow on on this. So this is not just a one time uh, shot at this. Uh, and I know that the National Democratic Institute is looking at a variety of ways where changes have to take place. So I think it's a very important, uh, uh, sp I think, spur to get us thinking about what democracy is really about. Thank you, Senator Sullivan.
Is the senator here? Yep. Ken, there you go. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, oh, thank you, Ken. Um, I think one of the most important things that can come out of this summit and going into the year of action is a very simple principle that democracies need to recognize that we have to stick together. Of course, we compete across a whole host of areas, economically, um, uh, certainly, but we need to recognize, and I think this uh, summit will help do this, that we are binded together by certain core principles. And um, we also need to recognize that they're particularly vulnerable members of our democratic community globally. I think one of the things that when we look back on the last few years that I think a lot of countries are gonna regret is just how muted the world's democracies were when the Chinese Communist Party essentially moved in to crush Hong Kong. We cannot allow that to be a lesson that they think they can take to other places, particularly uh, with regard to Taiwan. Uh, the United States has legal obligations with regard to the Taiwan Relations Act. And I think that we also need to recognize that Taiwan is not some um, uh, peripheral issue as it relates to democracies in the world, but in many ways is the front line of the distinction between democratic societies and authoritarian ones Similar to West Berlin in the 20th century, uh, I think Taiwan plays that role for the 21st century. And I think to the extent that the democratic family around the world can continue to highlight that country and the pressure it's under and make sure that the Chinese Communist Party did not um, learn the wrong lesson in its actions with regard to Hong Kong, I think that's gonna be an enormously important issue. If Taiwan is taken over militarily, that will change the entire trajectory of the 21st century. In many ways, um, if you look at historical analogies, the, ways, the way the guns of August in 1914 changed the trajectory of last century. We need to recognize that and we need to come together, all of us, to be ready for that. Thank you. Uh, Liz Schuler. Sure. Um, well, we just co-hosted a um, another site event yesterday with Labor Secretary Marty Walsh, uh, labor unions, labor ministers from around the world, um, along with uh, several U.S. government agencies. And we all collectively recommitted to the fight for democracy around the world and specifically the rights of workers. And so that's what I would hope would come out of the summit itself. Uh, because we want to see a people-centered foreign policy that, that prioritizes human rights and human well-being and that challenges um, the systems that are producing wealth and income inequality and that are disenfranchising people. Uh, we want to see democracy at the core of global development, you know, the agenda um, that, that we're pursuing and that um, fundamental work, worker rights are part of that agenda. Um, so just to put a fine point on it, do you know um, the world's most frequently violated set of human rights? Do you know what, what they are? It's labor rights. And I'm just going to tick through a couple of quick findings from the um, International Trade Union Confederation has a, a global rights index. And so the rights index for 2021 ranked 149 countries on the degree of respect for workers' rights. And they found that 87% of countries violated the right to strike. 79% uh, of countries violated the right to collectively bargain. 74% uh, of countries excluded workers from the right to establish or join a trade union. And the number of countries that denied or constrained workers' freedom of speech increased from 56 in 2020 up to 64 
in 2021. And workers experienced arbitrary arrests and detentions in 68 countries. Trade unionists were murdered in six countries, Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Myanmar, Nigeria, and the Philippines. So I say this because, and this has all gotten worse, of course, during the pandemic. So we hope that the year of action that's coming out of this summit, there will be some concrete follow-ups uh, you know, and a construction of a just and inclusive democratic future for working people, that, that social contract that I talked about that ensures workers' rights, jobs with minimum living wages and collective bargaining, uh, universal social protection, quality public services, fair taxation, gender and racial equity, uh, and of course, social dialogue that supports uh, real just transition for climate and technology, the jobs that we'll, we're going to be um, transitioning. So none of these ideas, of course, is remotely even possible without defending open societies, civic freedoms, civic space, strong uh, civil society, and universal human rights. Uh, and so I would just say that the Solidarity Center will continue our work in the 70 countries uh, around the world that we, we're, we work in, uh, in solidarity with the Ned family and with the world's workers and the democracy movement to make sure that this future that we all want becomes a reality. Thank you, Liz. And I'm, I'm sure that Senator Sullivan's grandfather would be very proud that your beginnings started at the IBEW. Absolutely. So, uh, Greg? Uh, the, I would hope that, th that at a minimum three things sort of come out of this year. The first that, as we all know, the democratic movement globally can, can wax and wane. And so I hope that this emphasis will really energize that movement and, and, and breathe life into something that's a, that, that's a serious initiative. Second thing, uh, I would hope sort of echoing what you all have said in one way or another, I would hope that it, that it serves to spotlight the real threats to democracy. We, we can look past many of these things for a variety of reasons. And I think, uh, I think the time might have come that we looked them in the eye. Uh, the third and, and final thought is that the year of action, whatever we wanna call it, might even galvanize us at home to rally around the idea in a bipartisan way uh, the need to aggressively confront these global threats uh, and to uh, uh, shape a, a bipartisan policy that, that leans forward uh, as we come to grips with some of these things that, is, as all of us have said, are, are absolute and, and genuine threats to, to uh, what we know to be liberal democracy. Thank you, Greg. Um, Secretary Albright, Senator Sullivan, uh, Chairman Lebedev and President Schuler, thank you for your insights and for all you do to make the world a more peaceful, democratic, and prosperous place. Uh, I will now turn this over to Ned's Vice President, Jody Herman, who will lead a conversation on meeting authoritarian challenges. Uh, thank you all. <laughs>